Well, welcome to January of 2022. We've just lived through a week of retrospectives and reviews of the year that uh, didn't quite go as planned for most of the people on the planet. Ralph Waldo Emerson began his great essay titled Nature with these words I want to think about today. Our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchers of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition and a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? End quote. Emerson was there calling for our theme of the month, Living with Intention. In the essay, Emerson explicitly dismisses those religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, by preaching, quote, why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not a tradi of tradition and a religion of revelation to us and not the history of theirs, end quote. Living with intention. And we sometimes call it living authentically, uh, but that phrase has gotten a bit muddied and confused by those very traditions uh, and retrospections that the uh, phrase tries to get out of. As Emerson would be quick to point out, one aspect of living with intention is the willingness to question our own assumptions, sometimes the deepest ones. So... Today, that's what I'd like to do, to encourage us all to take some of those cliches and conventions and assumptions out and take a good long look at them. All the while keeping in mind those lines from the poem by Blake, a truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. Well, when I was a kid growing up on a farm, there was a huge perceived difference between country folk and town folk. Now, I'm not talking about Appalachia versus Manhattan here. I'm talking about people like me who lived on farms and people who lived in the town where the grade and high schools were 10 miles away, all 1,100 of those people. The animosity ran so deep that in the 1980s, when Walmarts began opening up and destroying family businesses in the small towns, I was expressing some sadness at that situation, but my mother's response was, them city folk never did treat us right know-how. Now, when my father died, I wanted to get his suit dry cleaned before he was buried in it. I went to the local dry cleaners and asked if I could get that done quickly. No was the answer. I explained the situation, and the owner of the dry cleaners asked, well, what's your dad's name? To which I walked out because I knew what the answer was going to be. Now, how did people who have lived within a handful of miles of each other for generations develop that kind of animosity? Now, admittedly, my father never took a shower in running water and never saw a flush toilet and never had his clothes washed in a machine until he was in the army. But by my time, uh, when I was around there, the country folks, most of us had running water and electricity, just like the town folks. We didn't take baths less frequently than the town folks, and most of us didn't use corn cobs or Sears catalogs for toilet paper anymore either. And we didn't wash our clothes in boiling pots of lye soap. We were kind of alike at that point, but still that suspicion and animosity remained. I experienced it from the other side. Uh, after word got out that I had a college education, more than once I heard someone say something like, you ain't going to try learning me none of that, are you? So... What's happening there? Well, I want to say one word, and it's not a short one, but it's a very useful term, I think. Schizmo 
Genesis. The term schismogenesis was coined in 1935 by the anthropologist Gregory Bateson. Now, nowadays, Bateson is best remembered as being married to the vastly more famous anthropologist Margaret Mead. But in his own time, Bateson was a public intellectual and an innovative thinker. We still use some of his ideas today, even though he no longer gets uh, credit for much of those things he originated. In his book, Steps to an Ecology of Mind, Bateson defines schismogenesis as a creation of division. Now, this term derives from the Greek word schisma, cleft, cutting, right? which, of course, has been borrowed into English as schism, you know, two opposing factions split apart, and the word genesis, which means creation. Schismogenesis is the creation of a cleft or a division. All right. Now, Dr. Bateson claimed that we human beings define ourselves and each other through schismogenesis. Now, remember, Bateson was an anthropologist. He was describing schismogenesis as something endemic to the human mind and to human societies. Professor Bates was not attempting to fix the world with this idea of schismogenesis. He was trying to describe the world and how it works so we can better see ourselves. But uh, schismogenesis uh, makes a lot of sense as a useful term for me. It's uh, our method as human beings to both self-differentiation, the uh, us, the ego, the personal self, and also it's how we create group identification. We humans tend to find polar opposites, and then we attempt to define things by examining what those opposites create in terms of a frame. This is the way that we've learned to think uh, about concepts and the way we've found to create a solution to all kinds of challenges. I mean, think of all the ways we human beings create difference. It's uh, gender, race, age, ethnicity, social class, generation, urban, suburban, rural, and this, uh, the list just goes on and on and on. Schismogenesis is a feedback loop that functions in two directions. It continuously feeds us differences after we've noticed them, and it also continuously feeds us similarities after we have noticed those. And when it goes around, each iteration actually amplifies the last iteration, and so it's ever escalating. I have nothing in common with those people, we're pretty soon saying, or I'm exactly like those people or the most tragic one being, I am alone and no one understands me. Schismogenesis can also occur in terms of negative communication. No one says anything or shares anything. If I perceive that you're holding back, I'm going to start holding back. And then we're both holding back and we're really not saying anything of importance. Schismogenesis gives us things to think about and things to talk with each other about. Schismogenesis can also be at work in situations of domination and submission. I mean, that's how mansplaining and white splaining develops into feedback loops. Many white men fit into and understand the dynamics of a white heteronormative patriarchal structure, which brings with it assumptions concerning oh, appropriate communication styles and things such as that. And therefore, the white men have felt confident in those circles and in those structures, and therefore they talk more and explain more, while those who have traditionally been marginalized well, can't get a word in edgewise. This dynamic was explored by feminists uh, first back in the 1970s with the concept of male-identified women, meaning women who bought into the patriarchal system but learned to use it. Steel magnolias. Right? Given the concept of schismogenesis, it isn't difficult to see why in the tiny world I grew up in, there was such antipathy between country folk and town folk. We were so isolated from and different from the mainstream of America, and we were so similar to each other that we had to go about finding little things that made us different. We were making mountains out of molehills, schismogenesis. Schismogenesis 
leads to us and them thinking. It leads to viewing others as opponents rather than as partners. Now, allow me to add that uh, Gregory Bateson was also an early proponent of the term cybernetics, by which Bateson meant to simplify a little bit too much, feedback loops. Uh, in terms of the cybernetics of schismogenesis, that sounds complicated, but it's not. It's the creation of division and the opposite of schismogenesis, according to Bateson, was his definition of information. So those oppositions seem a little bit weird, dividing and information. Now, how does that work? Well, Bateson defined information as, quote, a difference that makes a difference. Okay, information is a difference that makes a, a difference. So we're all the time making uh, differences, but most of those don't make any sense. The takeaway is that we human beings often find differences that just aren't meaningful. Our differences that aren't important differences in any of the situations, you know, it's what we call a distinction without a difference, in other words. Uh, too often, our acts of schismogenesis do not create information. They only create noise, right? For example, I mean, think about it. What's, what's the difference between a conservative and a liberal? Uh, we can talk all day about that. Uh, but we have this schismogenesis. We have this, we say these things are very different. Uh, and I mean, that, that those two terms seem to have taken over from Republican and Democrat just pretty well uh, all around. Uh, yeah, in which case, you know, what's a moderate then, right? Or um, rhino, R-I-N-O, right? Republican in name only. What the heck does that even mean? How can you be something in name only? Well, we can keep all those labels going until we are in complete abstraction land and really kind of have no idea what we're talking about anymore. What's the opposite of a far-right, ultra-nationalist Christian authoritarian? I saw that term uh, the other day, a far-right, ultra-nationalist Christian authoritarian. Um, let's see. Would it be a far left, uh, or does this have to be a near left, right? Uh, ultra globalist, secular libertarian? I don't know. Just as our human minds can always imagine the largest number, and then we can always add one to that, right? The Googleplex plus one. Uh, we can always come up with yet another label, let yet another word to call someone, another hyphen. Schismogenesis simply has no boundaries, and neither do our capacities for fear and hatred, unfortunately. Professor Bates provides us with a way to clarify our differentiation process so that we can see and use its possibilities and its limitations. The concept of schismogenesis is a tool in our thinker's toolbox. Because the human capacity for compassion and love also are boundless when we allow them to be. And that's why we have this great theme this month, living with intention. We want to live with intention. We want to intend to have the ideas that we will or have with intention or not. Without intention, we merely continue to wallow in the pit that is the creation of our own divisions. Without intention, we can even get at half-truths and partial truths, which are far more damaging than simple lies, as William Blake reminded us. A truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. Also remember those words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition and a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? Those are some good questions. Why shouldn't we have a worldview of insight and not of tradition? Why shouldn't we have a politics of insight and not of tradition? Why shouldn't we have a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? Living with intention, well, Again, we sometimes call that living authentically, but that has a little bit of rust on it as a term, I think. As Emerson would point out, one aspect of living with intention is the willingness to question our own schismogenesis, 
the ways we are told that difference exists when in fact those differences are really just noise. And so that's what I invite us to do at the beginning of this new year. Let's take the Emerson Challenge and live with intention, questioning always our assumptions, even our deepest ones.